Good evening, everyone. Can I get a good evening? All right. Good evening, everybody. We're delighted to have you here tonight, both in person and online. I'm Susan Yaki. I'm the director of the La Follette School of Public Affairs, and we're so pleased to be hosting tonight's conversation with Tamara Keith, who's giving this year's Offner Lecture, our school's lecture series honoring former Wisconsin State Senator Paul Offner. I'm thrilled that Molly Collins Offner is here tonight to introduce our speaker and to tell us a little bit more about her late husband, Paul's legacy. I'm also excited that one of our amazing La Follette School students, Amelia Wagner, will be handling, handling our moderated Q&A for tonight's talk. Before introducing Molly, I wanna take just a second to tell you a little bit about the La Follette School. Anybody in the audience know about the La Follette School? All right. You know, it wasn't that long ago when I asked that question, not that many people knew. So the Laval School of Public Affairs is the home for public policy research and teaching on UW-Madison's campus, and it's one of the top policy schools in the world. We educate graduate students in our master's programs, as well as UW-Madison undergraduate students in our certificate in public policy programs. Right now, the Laval School is experiencing tremendous growth doubling the size of our faculty and almost quintupling the number of students that we serve all within the last four years. Part of that growth has been funded by a $10 million investment in the school by former Senator Herb Cole, and we are so thankful for that gift. That generous investment has changed the trajectory of the La Follette School and it enables us to convene events like tonight, where we can contribute to a thoughtful and civil dialogue around public policy issues and solutions. And now let me turn the mic over to Molly Offner to introduce tonight's speaker. In addition to being an amazing supporter of the La Follette School and a champion of the school and its students, Molly is a health policy expert and she currently serves as the Director of Policy Development for the American Hospital Association in Washington, D.C. And now please join me in welcoming Molly Offner. I'd like to extend my welcome uh, as well to everyone. And thank you for being here tonight and for tuning in uh, virtually. Uh, before we uh, turn to our distinguished uh, guest speaker, let me provide the context, as Susan suggested, uh, for this evening's lecture by telling you um, more about my husband, Paul Offner, and the fund in his name. He enjoyed a distinguished career spanning government, research, and education. And the Paul Offner Lecture celebrates that legacy of applying good scholarship to public policy solutions, especially for society's disadvantage. The lecture fund was established through the La Follette School of Public Affairs and supports important events like this evening's talk. Paul, born in Vermont, raised in Italy, and educated at Princeton University, arrived in Wisconsin with his PhD in economics to go on to serve in leadership positions in the Wisconsin State Legislature. It was here in Wisconsin that Paul formed his passion for thoughtful public policy and his belief that the solutions to society's toughest problems are within reach and creative ideas and good scholarship are the tools to find them. And the Offner Lecture was created to showcase these concepts. While in Wisconsin, Paul wrote, rewrote the state's civil service laws and was an expert on healthcare payment policy and insurance. Paul's passion for health policy took him to the Ohio Department of Health and then back to DC, joining the Senate Finance Committee and serving under the legendary Senator Moynihan. And then on later to the District of Columbia's Commission on Healthcare Policy. Um, at the end of his life, Paul returned to the law for public policy research, joining the Georgetown, Georgetown University's Institute for Healthcare Research and Policy and the Urban Institute. 
So now let me introduce to you our speaker. I'm very excited we are able to host NPR's Tamara Keith this evening. Ms. Keith, in her remarks, plans to focus on America's declining trust in traditional media and the significance of this trend in our democratic society. During the moderated Q&A, we'll explore Ms. Keith's reporting insights on how recent events and federal legislation have impacted vulnerable populations and further tie tonight's conversation to Paul's legacy. Ms. Keith has been a White House correspondent for NPR since 2014 and co-hosts the NPR politics podcast, the top political news podcast in America. During this time, she has covered several presidents, a global pandemic, and breaking news on global vaccine sharing. Since 2018, Ms. Keith has served on the board of the White House Correspondents Association and is currently its president. Ms. Keith joined NPR in 2009 as a business reporter covering debt downgrade, technology trends, natural disasters, and un unemployment. But she got her start in public radio as a teenager writing and uh, voicing essays for NPR's Weekend Edition Sunday. Ms. Keith went on to earn her undergraduate degree in philosophy and graduate degree in journalism from the University of California, Berkeley, while simultaneously launching her public broadcasting career at NPR's member station KQED. I give you Tamara Keith. Thank you all so much for being here and thank you Molly for the introduction and for the opportunity to deliver a totally depressing speech. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I will start by apologizing. This speech is not going to be particularly uplifting. Um, and that is because although I feel passionately about the critical role of an independent press in a functioning democracy, thinking too hard about the current state of our democracy or the state of my industry can be pretty depressing. Um, in fact, Americans are so politically polarized at this point that I fear one of the few things we may all agree on is that things are pretty broken. Um, though, of course, uh, we disagree on how they're broken or what's wrong. And certainly we don't agree on how it can be fixed. Um, so, as Molly said, I'm a White House correspondent for NPR. I've been doing that since 2014, uh, which I like to think of as the boring part of the Obama administration, uh, the final two years. Um, I'm currently the president, as Molly said, of the White House Correspondents Association, and that means that I advocate for the entire press corps. You see the dinner that we'll be putting on at the end of next month, um, but that is actually a very small part of what we do. Um, and Every day we are fighting the good fight to make it possible for journalists to cover the White House. Um, as a White House correspondent, I have a perspective on the news and on politics that I readily admit is not normal. Um, I go to work in the White House, um, in a tiny booth in the basement. Um, I fly on Air Force One and Air Force Two. Uh, I get to ask the president and vice president questions without fear because that is my job. Um, and I am there in the room or on the plane as a stand-in for the American people. Um, so I will let you in on a few secrets of the trade. Um, the iconic press briefing room that you see on TV every day is quite a bit smaller and quite a bit less impressive in real life than you might imagine. Uh, the chairs are literally falling apart. Um, and uh, Air Force One though, Air Force One is truly impressive. <laughs> um, it is as awesome as it seems. Uh, the food is not standard airplane fare. The Air Force team, uh, they shop at Costco and Wegmans for the meals. Um, and usually those meals thematically fit with where the president is going. Like you get cheesesteaks or you get a, a shrimp po' boy, depending on where you're going. Um, though. Uh, just to be clear, uh, we pay. We pay airfare and we pay for the food. Um, so there's no free ride and the American people are not paying uh, for us to be there. Um, but the fact that I know all of this means that I come from a place of incredible privilege. 
Um, you know, I am in the front row, or technically the second row, um, watching history unfold, sometimes playing a bit part in that history by asking the right question at the right moment. And it is a huge responsibility, but I would argue more than just about any other journalism job, uh, White House reporters um, are under incredible pressure. We face intense scrutiny, and we should. Uh, we are reporting on the President of the United States and how his decisions affect people's lives. And how we report it can affect how the public perceives the President and his policies. Uh, so the stakes are very high. Um, we have a lot of problems in the US right now, but I'd argue that many of them flow from, from this. We no longer have a shared set of facts. As a country, we lack agreement on really basic things. Um, like whether Joe Biden was elected president um, in a free and fair election. Um, also, whether what happened on January 6th uh, at the U.S. Capitol was an insurrection or whether it was a tourist visit. And you laugh, but this is, th there are people who are making that argument right now, and they work in the Capitol. Um, the evidence backing up reality is ample, and yet somehow these things are controversial. Um, history is being revised before our eyes, at least in, in some silos. So Gallup, which is a polling firm, has been doing polling going back to 1973, asking Americans about their confidence in the nation's institutions. And I wish we had numbers going back to the 50s, um, when people really had confidence, um, but we don't. Uh, we, uh, we have numbers going back to 1973, and Although that was not necessarily a high point for faith in American institutions, um, from that terribly mediocre starting point, uh, trust has taken a dive. So in 1973, warning, numbers coming, 39% um, of people had a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in newspapers. Today, it is 16%. So that's down five points from a year ago. Trust in Congress, organized religion, big business, they're all down. Um, Gallup started asking about television news in 1993, back when cable was still young. Um, and trust was at 46% that year. And now it is down to 11%. So um, that was a lot of numbers, but the point is that trust in American institutions is incredibly low. And that opens up people to believe conspiracy theories or to think that they can do their own research on the internet and come up with a better answer than what I'm reporting on NPR or what you can find on CNN or in the Washington Post or in your local paper. Um, there are many people who are far more willing to trust some random dude posting videos on YouTube um, and calling himself a citizen journalist than those that are maligned as the mainstream media. Uh, the Pew Center, uh, the Pew Research Center, also polls around questions of trust in institutions, and they found a stark partisan difference. Republicans are far less likely to trust the news media than Democrats. Uh, that partisan divide did exist before former President Trump came along, um, but his tactics and rhetoric only widened the partisan gap uh, in trust in the media. Um, with Trump in office, liberals saw journalists as frontline warriors in the resistance, um, which always made me deeply uncomfortable. And Trump and his supporters literally called us enemies of the people and targeted us with abuse. Um, so the Trump effect both boosted Democratic faith in the media and reduced Republican trust, widening the gap and moving the country further into information silos. And uh, I'm not here to say that the press hasn't contributed to the decline. Um, we certainly have. Uh, but especially in the past few years, we got a lot of help. Um, the, the national press in particular were, were not equipped for the Trump pre presidency. Um, we struggled to stand up for the truth and report reality, fact check the administration, which was almost impervious to fact checking. We struggled to do that while also maintaining a level of detachment um, with which we traditionally approached reporting the news. We were part of the story. We were a foil 
to a president who was intent on tearing us down because we were not willing to conform to his version of reality. And so we were constantly calibrating and recalibrating. Uh, at first, it was like, every tweet must be news. Stop everything. Report on the tweet. Um, and, and then we kind of dialed back on that. Like, what do you do when a president of the United States holds a press conference and delivers more falsehoods than truth? And what do you do when that's happening in the middle of a global pandemic when people are desperately in need of facts? Um, this challenge is beginning again as the campaign kicks into gear. And for instance, the former president tweeted that he was going to be indicted on Tuesday, last Tuesday. Um, and it didn't happen, and yet there was an entire week-long news cycle about the impending indictment that hasn't come. So early on in the Trump administration, I had a classic run-in with the social media buzzsaw. Uh, it was a Friday morning. I don't remember what the story was, but I sort of carelessly retweeted an AP story with a short comment. I promise it was not snarky. Um, it was pretty tame in my memory. And Press Secretary Sean Spicer put me on blast. He forwarded my tweet. I don't know what exactly he said, but it was something about fake news. And bam, I was just being like bombarded with angry messages and threats and just like the whole experience. Um, and I deleted Twitter from my phone uh, because otherwise that entire weekend would have been consumed by, oh my God, what do I do with these threats? Um, as it happens, I was checking into a hotel that night and I had a tag on my suitcase that said press because you have to tag your suitcases when you're flying on Air Force One so they know which ones to go to the press area. Um, and someone hopped into the elevator with me and asked if I was a journalist. And I very tentatively said yes because I figured everyone knew that I was under, you know, this in this storm. And the person said, oh, wow, I've never met a reporter before. Um, and, and there was a time, and that time is definitely not now, but there was a time when local papers were part of the fabric of every community, where reporters would show up at school board meetings and tree plantings. And you know, journalism wasn't some distant activity of elites. Journalists were part of the communities they covered. And it is a lot easier to question the motives of reporters to boo us, to say we are out to destroy America if you've never met a reporter. If journalists are just people you see on TV sitting around a glass table arguing about politics. Uh, in August of 2016, I was here in Wisconsin. Uh, I was covering a Trump rally in West Bend. The candidate was very late. It was very hot. Um, and people had been standing for hours on end. Um, and the press was in our usual pen um, where we are kept. Um, and a, a woman, this happened, to be, a, to be perfectly honest, this is not a Trump rally thing. This is every political event you cover, they try to keep you in the pen. <laughs> they don't want us out mingling. <laughs> Danger. Um, so a, a woman on the other side of this like bike rack fence thing was leaning against it. She was hot and miserable. And inside the pen, we had cases of Trump branded water. Um, so I offered her a bottle because like she loves Trump and she's clearly thirsty. Um, and she was super grateful, but also surprised like, why would I do that? Why would I give her water? Um, and it was this simple, normal, human, kind, just not even that kind. I mean, I was just like, like, you look like you need water. I'll give you water. Um, and it was like she couldn't believe that one of these enemies could be nice to her. Um, we are better. We are all better when we can see the humanity in others. Um, but so much seems to be working against the kinds of interactions that make that possible. Um, you know, once in office, former President Trump was not shy about how much he disliked his press coverage. Um, he, he seemed to sort of be expecting the same fawning coverage that he got when he was an entertainer and a hotel developer uh, where he could sort of just put out a cheese plate and um, 
get, get favorable headlines. Um, but being president is a very different job. Um, and the White House press corps takes our roles, shining light, bringing accountability on behalf of the American people, we take it quite seriously. Um, I interviewed Trump's third press secretary. You may not remember her. Um, she was Stephanie Grisham. Um, I interviewed her for, as part of her book tour for the NPR Politics podcast. Uh, her book was called I Will Take Your Questions Now, um, which was a heavy dose of self-deprecating humor because um, although it had been her dream to be the White House press secretary and to take questions in the Brady briefing room, um, she is the press secretary who never publicly took questions the entire time she was press secretary. She um, got measured for the, for the lectern, which is on hydraulics, but she never got to stand behind it. Um, so I asked her a question that I have long wrestled with. Um, Trump clearly craved approval more than just about anything else, including from the press. Um, and especially in private, you would see it. But even in public, you know, he actually seemed to like the reporters that covered him. Uh, he um, sought out these public feuds because they worked for him, sort of WWE style. Um, and he even seemed to seek the approval of the reporters who he most battled with. Um, so my question was, here's this person who at every rally gets the whole crowd to turn around and chant like fake news. Um, and yet he seemed to actually appreciate the news in some way. So what's up with that was my question. Um, her answer was that at first he didn't understand that, that the White House press corps was not going to cover him with kid gloves. <laughs> um, that he didn't understand why, why we were doing our jobs the way we were doing our jobs. Um, he didn't understand why he was being held to account for things he was saying and doing because that hadn't happened to him before. And then she said that at some point, Trump realized he was never going to win, that the press was never gonna go on easy on him. And he was angry about it. And so I will quote her here. She says, I think he was taking it out on you guys. And I think he enjoyed looking tough. And I think he realized he had something there. That is, he realized he had the power to turn his supporters on the press. He could just say the word and they would come after us shouting insults or delivering nasty messages and death threats. Um, he was like the conductor of an orchestra. Um, but here's the thing, no president likes their coverage. They hate it. Uh, they feel like we are never satisfied, that we're always looking for something negative to say. Uh, we never report enough on their, on their triumphs. Um, even presidents who from the outside appeared not to have combative relationships with the press, um, they also did not like their coverage. Um, so while Trump called us the enemy of the people, other presidents delivered platitudes about the importance of a free press um, while also conducting leak investigations and trying to force reporters to reveal their, their, um, their confidential sources. Former President Kennedy was the first president to truly harness the, the power of live television. And um, last week I was at the JFK Library for a panel discussion about the relationship between the president and the press. Um, Kennedy held 65 live televised press conferences during his shortened presidency. Uh, that was on average one every 16 days. Um, and as a point of comparison, President Biden has now held 23. And most of them have been truncated president, uh, press conferences uh, during overseas trips uh, with another world leader. Uh, so that is less than one press conference a month. Um, so why does any of this matter? Um, President Kennedy answered that question. He was asked um, how he feels, how he felt about the press coverage that he got. And he said that while he didn't love it, he preferred the American experience to that of the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, who never faced scrutiny because 
he never faced a free press. So I'm going to read a quote from President Kennedy here. Um, he says, there is a terrific disadvantage not having the abrasive quality of the press applied to you daily. To an administration, even though we never like it, and even though we wish they didn't write it, and even though we disapprove, there isn't any doubt that we could not do the job at all in a free society without a very, very active press. He goes on. Now, on the other hand, the press has the responsibility not to distort things for political purposes and not to just take some news in order to prove a political point. It seems to me their obligation is to be as tough as they can on the administration, but do it in a way which is directed towards getting as close to the truth as they can and not merely because of some political motivation. So every administration bridles at the press that cover them, and every president tries to get around the press corps to, as Biden's team calls it, meet the American people where they are. The Obama White House used social media, which was a sort of new innovation at the time. Trump uh, preferred live call-in interviews where he could just sort of take the wheel. Um, and then, of course, there were the tweets, so many tweets. Um, now, as a candidate, he's mostly using his network that he owns called Truth Social. And uh, that audience is pretty small uh, and very pro-Trump. Um, but if he posts something provocative, you know, as we did in the past, the, the press does the work for him. And it's amplified on cable and through social media, other social media platforms. Um, so Biden's claim team clearly does not like press conferences, but they do seek out local news interviews and entertainment shows. Uh, lately, Biden has even made some news via Twitter. But what all of that lacks is context. When they go straight to the American people, um, they're cutting out our context, sometimes called the filter. Um, you know. As journalists, our job is to seek out information and then distill it to something that the audience can understand, um, something that pulls the truth out of the noise. And um, I would argue that the filter has value. Filtering out good information from bad, sparing our audiences from information overload uh, while doing our best to paint a complete picture. So when an administration goes directly to their followers on social media or chooses interviews with favorable hosts on entertainment shows, what they are doing is narrow casting. Um, and in many cases, they're preaching to the choir. Um, and there may be a political calculation that speaking to those predisposed to like the president will do more to boost his standing with the American people than trying to persuade those who may be unpersuadable. Um, but what they aren't doing is speaking to the broadest cross-section of, of the American people. Um, they aren't seeking out those who disagree. Um, and maybe at this point, with our highly segmented media environment, there is no way to reach everyone anyway. You know, it's not, it's not that day gone by with just three television networks and three trusted anchors. And people are choosing their news by choosing their sources of news. Um, and that was never more clear than with the release of text messages and depositions and all of these other things related to the defamation case filed by Dominion Voting Systems against Fox News. Um, there is a blurry divide over there uh, between the ever-shrinking news shows and the evening programming that um, is more entertainment and opinion. Um, the messages released show that opinion show hosts were deeply worried, and also executives, were deeply worried that the people who they derided as the journalists were reporting the truth about the 2020 election. They were reporting that there wasn't widespread voter fraud and that Joe Biden's victory wasn't in doubt but that because they were doing it, the audience was being turned off. They were losing ratings. They could lose advertising revenue. They could lose stock value um, because their audience supported Trump. They supported the big lie, and they didn't want to be told that it wasn't true. Um, and the reality is that 
the most loyal Trump loyal viewers were fleeing to even more conservative networks that were just like not even talking about the election at all or not saying that Joe Biden was president elect. Um, you know, when a network that has news in its name is catering its coverage to what their viewers want to hear rather than the truth, that is dangerous. Um, like, no wonder the public has lost faith in the institutions of the press. Um, so as, as a White House correspondent, one of the most high, high profile parts of my job is attending the daily briefings. Um, you may have seen them on television. Um, in the Obama administration, they could last like 90 minutes long. They almost never made news. In the Trump years, they weren't even remotely daily, but when they happened, they lasted maybe 30 minutes and they were extremely combative. Um, and so, uh, like the Trump rallies um, <laughs> during the campaign, these briefings became must-see TV. Um, and that was good for a White House that wanted to portray the press as a bunch of rabid partisans doing, uh, doing battle with the press secretary. Um, it was not as good for the reputation of the press corps or for our ability to get basic policy questions answered. It became a show. Um, the Biden White House has made a point of resuming daily briefings. Um, they are, again, a bit longer. They are a lot less newsy. Um, and they almost never get carried live on TV. Um, you may have noticed some recent outbursts um, disrupting the briefings of late. Um, or me shouting at the top of my lungs, decorum, like that was going to help. Um, <laughs> turns out that's not effective. <laughs> um, but, but those fights were about demanding that the press secretary call on an individual reporter uh, rather than um, the sort of back and forth over politics and policy that happened during the Trump years. Um, I personally, uh, and I think a lot of people, in the press corps have a love-hate relationship with the daily briefings because they are a time suck. Uh, they are often late and then you're just waiting. Um, and they can be pretty performative all around. Um, but I have also come to view them as a critical component of a functioning democracy and an important symbol to the rest of the world. You know, the sheer act of asking a representative of the government questions without fear of reprisal would be impossible in many countries. Um, and several former press secretaries have told me that these briefings play an important role in good governance. In a well-functioning White House, they, as they're developing policy, a regular refrain from the press secretary would be, but how am I going to explain this to the press? Or how am I going to answer this question? Can it pass the sniff test? Um, and the fact that we're there asking questions force the, forces the White House to better vet their proposals and make better policy. Um, so um, despite all their imperfections, these briefings have a purpose. Accountability is good for democracy. Um, before I close out, I do want to discuss quickly um, what I see as some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, and the 24-hour news cycle, the wall-to-wall -wall coverage, the elections that never end because we're just always talking about politics every day and politics is re replacing sports and like it's replacing sports and church and hobbies like it's just replacing everything and that isn't necessarily healthy because it causes people to see the other party as bad or evil or you know they must be up to something wrong um, I'm also deeply concerned about what's happening with local media. Um, local public radio is kind of doing good, so go local public radio. But local papers are disappearing at an alarming rate. Um, in Salinas, California, this is a city in the central coast of California with a population of about 160,000 people the local paper doesn't have a single reporter left. Um, according to the story in the LA Times, the paper's last reporter quit in December. Um, the paper is owned by Gannett. This is one of the nation's largest news chains. Um, and it has been hemorrhaging staff nationwide and letting small town papers wither. And Salinas isn't even a small town. 
Um, local elected officials there are raising alarms about the lack of local news coverage in their paper. Um, the LA Times quoted a bookstore owner be bemoaning the lack of a paper. She said, without a local paper in our city, we've lost the power to tell the stories of the people in our city and the city itself. We've lost the power of storytelling. So recently, um, there was a lot of flooding in California. And the Central Coast was really badly affected by the flooding, um, flooding in farm fields uh, and everywhere. Um, but in that region, there are a lot of farm workers who are just incredibly vulnerable economically and in every other way. Um, and they're a critical part of that community in Salinas. But the stories of that flooding and the effects on the people who worked in those fields and who are part of that community, those stories weren't told in the local paper. And how are people supposed to respond to the needs of their fellow citizens if they don't even know about their struggles? Um, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and another example of what happens when there is not really any local media is someone can run for Congress, make up every aspect of their life. Like literally every, like, turns out he was Jewish. Um, his mother did not die on 9-11. Um, like every aspect of it. And no one found out until the New York Times finally decided to do a story after the election. Um, and as local papers wither, as regional papers wither, that's what you get. That's a lack of accountability. The voters did not have the ability to make an informed decision because they were not informed. Um, and how were they to know that everything was made up? It's not like citizens are supposed to call Baruch College and find out if the guy played on the volleyball team or even attended. Um, so, uh, so there we are. I'm running out of time, um, but I will end on a slightly, uh, slightly more positive note, um, which is to say there are things that we can do. Um, as a journalist, I can continue to do my best work, knowing that every day is another day when I have a chance to do better journalism. And every day is not going to be perfect. Um, there have been times when I was completely overwhelmed by the sense of responsibility that came with my job, and it could be paralyzing. And then I realized I just have to put one foot in front of the other, ask questions, write stories, shine light on policy decisions in Washington and what they mean for people in the rest of the country, and just do the job that I know how to do. What can you do? Read and support your local paper, please, um, and your local public radio station, if I may take a point of privilege. Um, pay attention to school board races and city council races, and not just what the president and Congress are doing. And also, please be skeptical of what you see on the internet, um, especially if it makes you angry. Uh, because if it makes you angry, that's probably by design. They're trying to get you to share it and spread it. Um, and do realize that you're living in a bubble. Um, and do everything you can to get outside of it, even if it makes you uncomfortable. Uh, and please do find hobbies that are not politics. Um, I realize you've got like a hot night out listening to a political reporter and I'm telling you, maybe come up with some other things. <laughs> but um, please stay engaged, pay attention, get involved in your community in a way that makes it possible to see that humanity in people who are on the other side, whatever that side may be. And now I think we get to do questions. Is this thing? It is on. Is mine? Maybe not. Is yours? Not yet. Oh, there, you there we go. There Perfect. You are.
Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Amelia Wagner. I'm a graduating Master of Public Affairs. Um, <laughs> almost done. <laughs> um, I'm also the president, president of the LaFault School Student Association. So on behalf of the student body, I would like to thank you for spending so much time speaking with us and on campus today um, and this week. So thank you again for being here. Um, and we can jump right into the first question. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, perfect. Um, so declining trust is not unique to the media. As you said, we've seen it across institutions, political, religious, even education. Do you think that declining trust in institutions is more prevalent in the US than in other countries? No, I don't think so. Um, I think that there are a lot of other countries you can look to that have similar problems and similar challenges. and actually have large populations that believe the same conspiracy theories that people in America believe. Um, and there are other leaders in other countries that have authoritarian tendencies and there are democratic erosions happening all over the place. And in some of those countries, people are like happy to have the democratic erosion. Um, I think that, you know, I started out at NPR as a business reporter and I think that we possibly underestimate the the like total break that people felt with the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009. That that like the the entire nation experienced a trauma, and many people's lives did not recover from that, um, or it took a very long time. And certainly, faith that like the little guy can work hard and get ahead was dramatically broken. Meanwhile, the big corporations got bailed out. Now, they ultimately had to pay it back and the government was made whole. But there, there was this feeling that, you know, nobody went to jail and lots of people were hurt. And I think that was then followed by, we had this pandemic that also dramatically affected people's lives and, um, broke the social fabric. And I'm a, really thrilled that all of you people are here in person. Um, but there are a lot of parts of our lives that people fell out of the habit with and haven't returned to. And it made it much easier to, uh, you know, go into your silo when you, you're literally only seeing like two friends. So I think that we've had these big seismic things that have happened that, um, that we, that is a context um, around some of this decline in trust. Absolutely. Um, on that same theme of trust, uh, it brings to mind a UW-Madison visit with David Brooks. Um, so the fall it hosted him in 2021, and he gave what he called an unusual talk about politics. Um, so he contended that many of our society's great problems flow from people not feeling seen. Do you think that this societal decline in trust stems from people feeling invisible? And do you think the news media can help to address this? Well, I definitely think people feel in, invisible. Um, I don't know if that is the whole cause of, of what ails us. Um, I think there are many factors that include a lot of people not feeling like their government works for them. Um, and, you know, look no further than Silicon Valley Bank failing and all of a sudden, you know, some some like venture capitalists who up until the moment they needed the government were like total libertarians, um, then sort of saying like, no, you have to, you, you have to do this. Um, and and it, like, obviously there's also a very compelling argument about the need to prevent a, you know, a cascade effect. But I think that there, there just are constant reminders for anybody who uh, wants to see the worst in the institutions that, that there, are, there are things to feel bad about <laughs> around many corners. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for that. The LaFault School places a high priority on civil discourse and in particular respecting for different viewpoints. Um, see this in the classroom, our speakers as well. So in your reporting, where do you see signs of hope that civil and productive conversations can be part of the political process? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there are, um, 
Here, I'm going to tell a story about my softball team. <laughs> this is hopeful. <laughs> Please do. Um, so I play on a softball team. My team is called the Bad News Babes. And we are the women of the press corps in Washington. Not all the women, just a few. Um, and we play in a game once a year to raise money for a breast cancer um, uh, charity. Uh, we play in a softball game against female members of Congress. Now, the great thing about this game is that it is bipartisan. So um, while the boys, uh, the men's baseball team, baseball game, is Democrats versus Republicans, because there are enough of them who are sporty, um, that also means that they don't practice together, um, and they're against each other on the field. Whereas with the Congressional Women's Softball game, they practice together early in the morning, at least once or twice a week. Um, we have mixers, or whatever you call it, receptions, <laughs> where, um, you know, like Democrats and Republicans are dancing with each other. Um, and, uh, and we provide them with a common foe, um, though they don't, <laughs> they mostly just hurl insults at us that are like, you guys are young and that's cheating. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of trash talk, but um, it's like really healthy. Um, and it's one of the rare things that continues to exist where um, you know, our leaders can hang out with each other. And, and, and in reality, like legislation has come from the softball game, like relationships, lasting bipartisan relationships um, have come from this bipartisan legislation. It's actually a pretty encouraging thing. So the answer to civil discourse is trash talk on the softball field. Yes, that, I'm that is, okay. it's extremely civil. <laughs> um, okay, moving, moving on. So while covering modern politics, um, how do you balance the growing pressure to lean into extremes while, and you spoke to this a little bit, but while providing your audience with the facts? So how do you manage that newsworthiness? And I think that there, <laughs> I think there's actually a little bit of a generational divide because sometimes when I talk to young journalists, though I will say that this didn't happen here in Wisconsin, um, but sometimes when I talk to younger journalists, they, 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 they don't like the idea of objectivity. Like I, I spoke to a young journalist the other day who said objectivity is BS. Um, and she believes it and it is a passionate part of her approach to journalism. Um, and there is an argument that, you know, doing the both sides thing is a disservice to the audience. Um, so there's, Somewhere between both sides and objectivity is BS, I think there is an answer. Um, and I don't claim to always have the answers, thank goodness. Um, but I do think that it is important for our stories to bring the truth to light, to sift the truth out of the noise. And what that means, I, I don't think that that is a partisan view. If someone is doing something that is, if they're, if they're telling a lie or they're repeating something that is not true, it is not my job to put it on the air and amplify it, um, unless the lie is the news, in which case you sandwich it. You make a true sandwich and um, you introduce the clip by saying what the truth is, you play the clip, and then you come out of it and you fact check it again. So there's no question. Um, I, so I guess I'm, I'm a partisan for the truth, um, but you know, just as I think it is tragic that the, the, the waning group of journalists who are at Fox News were pressured into reporting what their audience wanted instead of reporting the truth. And they held firm and not, like the, journal, the actual journalists were, I mean, there, there were people who, like the, the hosts were trying to get fired for reporting the facts. Um, just as I think that Fox um, 
telling the audience what they want to hear is like a really bad idea instead of telling the audience what they need to hear. Um, similarly, get, you know, I got a lot of pressure from people on the left from time to time to do something or say something in a way that they felt it needed to be said. And I also feel that I'm not here to make you feel comfortable. I'm not here to tell you what you want to hear. Um, which, you know, sometimes is difficult, but I, I hold pretty firm to the idea that, that we, we just need to report things fairly. Absolutely. Um, so switching gears a little bit, since this is La Follette's annual Offner lecture, as Molly introduced, um, let's shift our focus to lower income populations. So first, I'd like to ask, which media outlets do the best job prioritizing or lifting up communities of color or populations whose voices are often absent or underrepresented in mainstream discussions in the media? Um, so NPR is doing a lot of work on this. Um, and what I mean by we're doing a lot of work on it is every time I come back with a story, my editor says, like, what diverse voices are you going to have in your story? Um, and we log the data about who's in our story, the demographic data about who's in our stories in an effort to improve. Um, I think a lot of it is also about hiring and making sure that there are people in the newsrooms who have these lived experiences. And I also think that when you talk about diversity, you also need to talk about diversity of experience and life experience. And what I mean by that is it can't all be Harvard and Yale people on your staff. and if you if you want to represent um, the broadest part of the population, absolutely. Um, so I would say us uh, and um, <laughs> but to name another outlet, uh, 19th News, which is a small online uh, news outlet that um, is sort of tailored towards um, the stories of women and people of color. Um, is they do a very good job. They have really, really good people working for them. Thank you for sharing that resource. Yeah. Um, so similarly, what recent federal legislation do you believe will have the biggest positive impact on lower income families? I mean, sometimes it's hard to know before it's fully implemented. I think that um, it has not passed yet, and it may get punted, but I actually think that the Farm Bill um, is a critical piece of legislation and is going to be a, a real battleground um, around the, the SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition um, Program. And that Supplemental Nutrition and how the rules are defined um, is, is a really significant way um, that people can thrive and survive, um, depending on how, how it ends up coming out. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act that was recently passed certainly has um, a number of provisions that haven't really gone into effect yet about prescription drug pricing. Um, and the Affordable Care Act, which has um, been around for now a long time and is probably not going anywhere, um, it finally seems to have cemented itself politically. Um, you know, like North Carolina just expanded Medicaid. Um, and I think there are maybe only 10 states left that haven't expanded Medicaid. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> A lot of pointing over here. <laughs> um, but that, you know, that legislation is making a difference. Um, you know, as, as you all know, um, medical expenses are a huge factor. Um, medical debt can just hold people back. Um, and, you know, it's the kind of thing that you're not planning on, and then suddenly you can't work and you can't afford your medical bills. And um, so having a safety net um, is, is one of those things that has been very helpful and will continue, I think, to um, help people. I, um, I did a story, a series of stories in 2011 about people who were long-term unemployed. So they had lost their jobs and they could not find new jobs. And it was, um, it was uh, one of the more rewarding projects I've worked on. They did audio diaries. Um, I was going to send Christmas cards this year to 
people, and I was looking up what Randy was up to um, for my story, for my series, and I found his obituary. Um, and he was probably in his late 50s, and he had um, epilepsy, and he, according to his girlfriend who was quoted in the story, um, he couldn't afford his medication, and so he stopped taking it, and he had a seizure and crashed into a river. Um, so, like, the consequences are very real. Um, for people not being able to afford their medications. There are real decisions that have to be made um, that are absolutely tragic. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, sorry. Bringing it down again. <laughs> Switching gears a little bit. Yeah. Um, but last, last fall, the LaFault School partnered with local media to engage Wisconsin's voters in conversations about policy issues that are the most important to them. So we called it the Main Street Agenda, and our faculty traveled across the state. We learned that people are enthusiastic about having thoughtful conversations about public policy and want candidates to be talking about issues that are important to them. How does or can the news media respond to this desire? I question your survey design. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> I'm not owning it. No, um, <laughs> what I would say is that, like, in the abstract, everyone wants to have thoughtful conversations. And in reality, everyone just wants to like shout about the latest indignity or like, can you believe what that guy said about Disneyland? Um, so um, I would argue that in part, the onus is on everyone. Um, if you want to have more thoughtful conversations about policy, then, you know, don't hate click. Because many news organizations are writing the stories that you have shown that you want to read, even if you claim you want to have a conversation about policy in a serious way. Um, and then also, like, yes, the, the media f does this, right? Like, um, the thing that I think about um, most recently is the budget. So the president has a budget. These budgets are fake. Um, and um, they're press releases. Uh, and they have a lot of numbers for a press release. They have a lot of pages for a press release. But in the end, it's just a vision document. It's a statement of values. OK, so we have like one big day of coverage of the president's budget. And if we're doing our jobs right, we say, but this is just a vision document, it's a press release, it's total junk. Um, but enjoy, everybody. And then um, we wait for Congress to do something. And then inevitably, there's like a big fight, and there's a cliff of some kind, and there's a deadline that they're going to miss, and we're very focused on are they going to make the deadline, and what happens if they don't make the deadline. And then sometimes they miss the deadline, and they punt for a few weeks or a few months or whatever, um, and we're still just reporting on the fight. And we're not reporting on the substance so much. We're reporting on the fight. Because that's like the sports part of journalism. It's very easy to report on the fight. And people want to read about the fight um, or listen to stories about the fight. Um, unfortunately, they are less interested in going line by line through the budget documents. And the reality is that the way this news cycle works, there's the fight. And then at some point in the middle of the night, there's the agreement. And then you do the story that says, and they have reached a deal, the government will not shut down. You're welcome. And, um, and then like a few people will go through the budget with a fine tooth comb, but almost nobody does. Um, because the, move, the news cycle has moved on. And, um, you know, this is, this is a challenge. Um, and, you know, like, nobody actually wants a story about the budget once there's a deal. But when they're fighting, you don't know what's in it. And then it's over. And then they're fighting about something else. It's a difficult balance, I'm sure. Yes. Um, so speak, similarly speaking to some of the work the LaFault School has done, um, so they launched, or we launched, the results of our first ever policy poll, poll 
that gauged how Wisconsinites feel about their most pressing policy issues. One interesting finding was that climate change ranks as the top issue for Wisconsin residents. While more Democrats rank climate highly than Republicans do, there was widespread support across the political spectrum for tackling climate change. From your vantage point, how do you see policymakers addressing climate change over the next few years? Well, they just did. I mean, I'm not saying that the Inflation Reduction Act is actually going to fix climate change. Um, but there was this gigantic piece of legislation that has a huge investment in, um, in clean technology and in encouraging clean technology. Um, and that includes everything from like tax rebates to buy heat pumps and maybe some public education about what a heat pump even is. Um, you know, tax rebates for hot water heaters and solar panels and all of these things. And the idea is that this will also create jobs. Um, installing these things, weatherizing homes, all of that. And if your home is weatherized, um, then your electricity bill isn't as high, which is a helpful thing on the money side, but it's also, um, you know, you're not using as much energy, so there's less emissions. Uh, if you're using an efficient washing machine or dishwasher, then you're using less water. And why do you need to use less water? It's ample, right? Except in California, except right now it is ample. Um, because water is a huge user of energy. Cleaning, delivering water uses a huge amount of energy. Um, but, you know, like, if you go back to the 2008 presidential campaign, both candidates believed that climate change was real. Both candidates even agreed on, like, maybe there should be some sort of cap and trade thing. And then House Democrats passed something, and it didn't go anywhere in the Senate, and it died. And, um, and ever since then, climate change has become an incredibly polarized issue. Um, I think younger Republicans are actually do care a lot about climate change, um, but it's very it is a very partisan issue, like so many of our other issues. Um, so I don't know that in a divided Congress anything is going to pass, or that there is going to be any major move on the political front. But I do think that you know individuals are buying electric cars, they're buying hybrid vehicles. Um, and individuals are making um, small changes on their own. It's interesting to hear from your vantage point, so thank you. Um, I am curious about your time at, in Madison. Uh, you've, you've been spending a lot of time with La Follette students and classes this week. So what interesting things are you learning about our state and about our students? Um, what's been fascinating is there are like some very predictable questions that people always ask me. and the students here have not been asking all the predictable questions. It's great. Um, and every class I've been to has been like a completely different conversation. Um, they, they're ta they take the conversation in different directions. They're extremely curious. The great, I, I've really enjoyed all of the questions. They've been, it's just been so unpredictable in a really wonderful way. Um, so that's been very exciting. And then I've been learning a lot about your, um, your election that's coming up. Um, <laughs> I've asked some very dumb questions uh, and gotten some good answers. And um, I'm hoping tomorrow to find a small window to go interview some people outside of a polling place. Um, that is just fascinating. Breaking records and, um, you know, like not every state has judicial elections. Um, this is deeply weird to me. <laughs> um, and yet, I'm almost certain that next week we will do an episode of the NPR Politics Podcast about that, that state Supreme Court election because it, the stakes are very high. A lot of money is being spent. Of course, um, the money that is being spent on that race, being spent on organizing, getting people to vote, does lay the groundwork for 2024. Um, it's the sort of organizing that pays dividends later. So there, there are multiple reasons why people might be dumping a lot of money into your state right now. <laughs> Look forward to hearing that episode of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, you That's and me promised. both. Yeah. <laughs>
hopefully I, I win the battle of what the topic will be. <laughs> Um, so from the student perspective, um, you know, unfortunately, and you've spoken to this, many students and professionals in the policy arena are distrustful of the news media. What would you like students, particularly students like myself graduating with Master of Public Affairs, going out into the world of policy, to know about the role of the media in preserving democracy as a fourth estate? So give us a chance. Um, we are all just trying to do our best, and sometimes we do well, and sometimes we fail, and that's... That's to be expected, all of us, everyone fails sometimes. Um, and I would point back to President Kennedy and I would point back who also was not super transparent about a whole lot of things, <laughs> to be clear. But he had a relatively good relationship with the press, which he leveraged to not have to be very transparent about a lot of things. Um, but I would point back to President Kennedy and what he said about the importance of that scrutiny and of that back and forth and what former press secretaries have told me about the value of being half, you know, having to explain it. They aren't explaining it to us. We're just there sitting in those seats asking those questions as a stand-in for the American people. And on our best days, we're asking the questions that everyone out in America is thinking. And on the worst days, we're a bunch of grandstanders and I have to shout, decorum! <laughs> oh, so I have one last question for you. Yeah. Um, so what advice do you have for a school of public policy like the LaFollette School, which seeks to educate the next generation of leaders for our state, country, and world? I don't think you need my advice. <laughs> I think I need your advice. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say... Um, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Keep asking the questions. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Please join me in a warm round of applause for our guests. Thank you. Thank you.